please bear with me. Oh, uh, I didn't spell that B A R E. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> now, uh, this reading is taken from uh, A Secret of the Sphinx, one, the second of the McHugh. Uh, memoirs which were mentioned. Uh, they all relate to the adventures of Rory McHugh, a young Canadian of Scottish French descent who uh, was raised by the Blackfoot Indians in the 1790s. Uh, I have titled this reading Midnight Introductions. It takes place in Cairo, Egypt in December 1797. My sweet Bella Lot would never betray me for another, far is asserted. It will be so wonderful to embrace my darling again. The poor sot fell silent for a moment. He believed I was French, and I've always been seen to have a sympathetic ear, so he had babbled on and on to me ever since our introduction. Forrest proudly wore his uniform, that of a lieutenant in the Regiment de Chauvier de Chevelle, while I was clad in the pajamas of an Egyptian peasant. On my feet were a pair of ridiculous red slippers. Their toes curled made me cringe with embarrassment. Upon our arrival in Cairo late that evening, we went straight to Forrest's apartment. The love-struck husband rushed inside while I waited outside. Moments later, he emerged in a blazing rage. He had been told that his loving wife had moved to Sheikh el Becker's palace with General Bonaparte. <laughs> it was midnight when Lieutenant Forrest barged into the Sheikh's huge mansion. Fortunately, he kept his wits about him long enough to claim to be returning from his mission for General Bonaparte. I trailed in his wake as he stormed down the various corridors, all deserted at this time. Eventually, at the far end of the hallway, we spied a solitary figure in baggy red pants and a turban of some sort. Ah, one of the Mamelukes about whom I'd heard so much. Forez strode down the corridor towards the door. The young guard stepped before him to block his way. In true Mameluke fashion, he was armed with, to the teeth with archaic weapons. But they didn't faze the angry husband, who brushed past him shouting, Jenneru, take care of this fellow! The bewildered guard was tall. Strong fellow, about my age. I was unarmed. So I made a vaguely threatening gesture towards him, and he drew his attention to me. He reached for his scimitar. Oh, and I knew I was finished if he succeeded, so I drew back my right fist and drove it as hard as I could into his face. He staggered, but didn't fall. I swung my foot up, intending to catch him in the crotch, but he had evidently done a bit of brawling himself, for he avoided the blow and seized my foot. Thrusting back, he sent me sprawling to the floor, while he was left holding one of my red curly-toed slippers. Again, he reached for that tremendous scimitar. So I threw myself upon him like a bobcat, with desperation as my only plan. The impetus drove him back and we crashed through the partially closed door. Rolling sideways to evade his grasp, I leapt to my feet. A female voice gasped in terror behind me, and I heard Forez yelling, You little tart! You deceitful bitch! I'll teach you to betray me! I turned partially and glimpsed the lieutenant, brandishing his sword belt, which he brought down to a tremendous whack across the bed in front of him. Just in time, a vision of loveliness sprang from the satin frills onto the floor. Forgetting my opponent, I stared open mouth. One must remember that this is the, my first ever glimpse of a pretty European lady wearing absolutely nothing. <laughs> Not so innocent, my opponent. 
I heard him scrambling to his feet behind me. At the same time, the charming little creature darted in front of me, keeping me between her naked loveliness and her husband's avenging belt. I felt it sting across my shoulders as Bellalot threw herself into my arms, the better to control my movements. Behind me, the Mameluke roared as he leapt in front of Forez. Next thing I knew, my opponent and I were back to back, intervening most actively in the Forez domestic dispute. The Mameluke fending off the blows of the sword belt, while I manfully shielded the plumply luscious Bellalot, whose brown tresses pressed against my chin as she clutched me. I reciprocated by clasping her shapely buttocks with both protective hands. <laughs> Silence! Silence! Screeched the most commanding voice I had ever heard. Madame Forez relaxed in my arms for a second, then pushed back. Indignation replaced fear on her round baby face when she cried out to the invisible presence behind me, He's mad! He's a beast! I never want to see him again! Silence! screamed the strident, high-pitched voice again. We all turned to discover the source of such a screech. There stood a scrawny, pale young fellow, wearing only a bleached nightshirt, a nightcap, and a baleful glare. Ridiculously skinny white legs protruded from beneath his nightie. Only his raging red visage and several straggles of long, unkempt hair brought color to this scrawny phantom. I reacted the only way possible. I burst into laughter. The specter's glare settled upon me, stifling my ill-timed outburst. Struggling to restrain his anger, he hissed through clenched teeth. You too have done well to protect Madame Forez. Then taking a deep breath, he exploded. Now get out! <clears throat> Although the command was in French, filtered through a strong Italian ex accent, there was no mistaking its meaning. The Mameluke and I backed towards the door, bowing and scraping un in unison. The eternal triangle remained glaring at one another. So and ended my introduction to France's most famous citizen, General Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> Outside the door, I stared at my opponent, noting that the red welt I had given him under the one eye. That convinced me to depart Sheikh El Bekri's palace without delay. As I edged away, I saw relief spread over the Mameluke's face at having gotten out of the room. But in a flash, he remembered the original state of affairs and turned to stare at me. I nodded and flashed what I fondly hoped was a friendly smile, then set off down the corridor to run. The marble floors made it difficult to keep my footing, especially with one foot bare, and I had no idea where to go. I soon found myself trapped in a courtyard with no escape. Seconds later, the Mameluke in his leather sole boots skidded into the moonlit space. Wide-eyed astonishment on his boyish face his arms flailing as he tried to remain upright. It was too much for me, and I burst into laughter. He glared at me. <coughs> then a flicker of a smile crossed his face, for I must have been a pathetic sight standing there in my ridiculous red slipper with boyish clenched fists as my only weapons. Manfully, he attempted to remain to maintain his threatening glare. Then he, too, burst into laughter. We remained there roaring hysterically. This laughter initiated one of the strangest friendships I've ever enjoyed or endured. <laughs> the event is true. The only thing fictitious is McHugh, the one who tells the story. And... Uh, the other four characters are all real historical figures. <laughs> Some of them, three of them not famous. The one who later became famous, uh, and 
the terrible things he did. Despite that, he, uh, if you go to Paris, you'll find monuments to Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor. Mm -hmm. Makes me worry because does this mean that in another hundred years there'll be statues of Adolf Hitler in Berlin? Because this That's was right. his beginning. He really did this. <laughs> and uh, historians have dealt with it. I just inserted McHugh. Hmm.